You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I'm recording this in Mexico, in the lovely town of Merida, and I'm very, very uh, happy to say I have a special guest back on the show for the second time. It's Judd Weiss, who's calling in from California. Hi, Judd. Hey, Jake. Great to have you back on the show. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's been about a year and a half since we last talked, and it's, uh, it was a really, really great interview. If, if people haven't heard it yet, the one called Successful Entrepreneurship, I really recommend having a listen. And, and so, yeah, how have you been in the last uh, year and a half? How's, how's things going for you? Well, life is insane, my friend. There's, there's been a lot of things uh, uh, going on. And yeah, I, 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 a, a lot of change and focus. And, you know, the world's been in turmoil lately. But I can't complain too much. I, I'm still doing okay. You know, I guess you've seen my Facebook. You can see I'm, I'm still living all right. I do. Yeah, so. I, I, I do. Uh, your Facebook is an endless list of beautiful photographs that you take of beautiful people having what seems to be a great time, most, usually at your apartment as well, at your house. Yeah, I have a lot of parties <laughs> at my place. I still have. And as you might have realized, I have, I have a lot of these libertarian-ish events where it's like a cocktail party. It's, but it's, it's a hot party, just like any other hot party, except that I'll have a, a speaker. So I break all of the Hollywood party rules and actually stop a party, have somebody to discuss politics for about 20-something minutes, have a Q&A, and then go back to having a party. Awesome. And, and they, they've been working out great. I mean, the, the uh, demand is now so insane. I can't have them public anymore. It's just like one... the. Last time the party was actually public, where I allowed anybody to just attend, I uh, had 385 confirmed, 85 maybes, like, plus another list of people that were, that were coming. I, it was like, I, I was so scared that I couldn't actually fit that many people in my house. But you realize there's like the physics of straws. Like, how do you get all those straws in the box? You can actually do it it physically but it's not so comfortable so <laughs> it was you know so they're, they're pretty popular um i have now toned that back i'll never let that happen in my house again but um uh, you know these events have been a great, great success and, and i've made a very comfortable atmosphere for people to to engage in ideas or just come out and have a good time at a good party with meet a lot of great people and and so uh it's something unique and different it's been pretty popular so yeah i've been doing a lot of that and just you know there's a, i have a wide network and there's a lot of attractive people and so I, I tried to make sure it's it's like that for the parties. Yeah. So um, I was thinking uh, of talking one. I was thinking one thing it would be really good to talk to you about is some of the kinds of people issues that entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs face. Um, and I was particularly struck by in our last conversation by you know your experience and and your personal approach towards your business relationships, in particular with your clients. Because I think with all working relationships, there's that question in, in any project or, or uh, work event that you're involved in where there's a specific negotiation about something. And there's like the, the thing that you're negotiating uh, that's at stake. And then there's also the relationship that's at stake. And mm -hmm. it's very, very easy um, when you start a business. And I know that I, you know, I experienced this very, very easy to be sort of down in the trenches and very focused on the stuff you're negotiating. So you want to get a new project off the client and you want to get a new client, you want to get paid for the work, you want to get as uh, a good as price as you can, you need to hire people to do the job, you want them to get the work done, and so on and so forth. And the issue is that you can get very focused on getting specific things negotiated, but there's also the relationships that you're building. And in, mm -hmm. in particular, especially with clients, but with all of the people when you get into entrepreneurship, that brings a whole host of people questions that I think, you know, are, are really challenging um, and, and uh, I'll deal a lot more with kind of the psychology of the situation as well as, if you like, the business specifics. Cool. I love to talk about that stuff. Uh, to go really broad, the only time, I mean, I'm a very independent person. I, I like to do a lot of things on my own. I don't, you know, I don't like 
uh, people going through my stuff and my closet and rearranging. I like to just do everything and fix everything. I'm I'm a terrible delegator, and I like to be be very hands on on everything. But the only time when you don't need to deal with relationships and understand other people is if you're living on a deserted island and you just have to make your own way, or, or you've got a farm to yourself or something like that. Otherwise, relationships are crucial to everybody, and everyone has to think very deeply about how they're interacting with people. And, and the key to that, in my opinion, is, is to, be, to, to generate the skill of stepping out of yourself and out of your situation and into the other person's head and their situation and trying to understand as much of that as physically possible. Because whether it's a business partner or a client or a competitor or a employee, you want to understand their motivations as well as humanly possible because you want to see... You want to you want to be able to because you're you're about to make moves so you want to be able to see the chessboard in essence and and a lot of those pieces are hidden from you like there's there's you know um, you got to understand the motivation of biz, other business partners on that person or friends or spouse or their kids or, or their mentors mentors is a big thing that a lot of people just don't focus and and you want to undercover as many pieces on the puzzle that were hidden as possible so you'll know how to move. So um, relationships, how you approach relationships is important. And, and, a, and the most important aspect of how you approach relationship is getting in the other person's head as much as possible. I couldn't agree more. I think that is um, a, a really important aspect. H how did you come, like you obviously think about that very consciously. Yes. How did you how did you come to to be really conscious of how important it is to kind of you know to have empathy for the other for the other person involved in negotiation to understand it from their side? Is that something that you know you you had in the beginning or did it come through experience with uh, with your businesses? I think part of it is you commonly hear about how helpful failure is mm. and why failure is such a helpful thing. Well, yeah, yeah, I I, I was not conscientious multiple times and I've got burned and I think, all right, how did I lose that $80,000 commission that I want to cry about? I'm a grown man, but I'm in tears right now. What did I do here? You know? Yeah. And, and I, all right, I said something really stupid to the, to the lady and the seller, and she doesn't want to work with me anymore. And it's my fault. And I didn't understand where she was coming from. Uh, so I think that, that developed over time. I mean, I'm just somebody who tries to always, I'm, I've, I've got, we've, we've got a philosophical background. So I always try to look at things like that, and yeah. I've approached business that way. So I'm really appreciative of my philosophical background. It's helped me out in, in business in ways where you don't, might not normally think it would. So I guess it really comes from that. Yeah, awesome. Well, I think one of the you know, most important relationship questions is, if, if you're starting a business, is whether or not you're doing this yourself on your own, or whether you have co-founders, and whether you go into business with other people, often for young entrepreneurs, that'll be a question of like, you know, they've got a couple of friends, they start talking about this project that they can have, and are they going to go into business with each other? And, you know, I wonder if you could share some thoughts uh, for somebody who's in that position of what you think about this question about working or founding uh, with other people, your new business. Yeah. Generally, don't do it. It's a bad idea. <laughs> right. That's, that's my shorthand advice. Uh, no, the, the problem is that most uh, business partners, business partnership is a very explosive, dangerous subject. And um, it gets bad fast. It, it's, if you don't know what you're doing, you're probably going to have a total meltdown disaster. Uh, hopefully, you weren't previously friends because you probably won't be afterwards. This is something I see it over and over again. And some things that you want to think about when you do... I, I've had successful partnerships. I had a really bad mail partnership with a guy who tried to take a lot of money from me. And, from me and it was really bad. And yeah, so, so uh, a lot of people have been through that experience. And the problem... The, I think the main thing to think about in a partnership is don't go into a partnership because you're friends. I can't think of a worse thing to do. A lot of people just do that. They're like, we both love this stuff. Let's just go into business together. There's six stories we've heard about. Uh, I mean, m most of those crash and burn, and those friends are not friends, and they hate each other. And, and uh, you know, like, 
I, I've heard plenty of stories of guns being pulled at each other and shit like that. So it's, it's a really dangerous situation. It, friends don't make a partnership. A, a difference in skills set makes a good partnership. So, like, for example, my first partnership was with a guy who, um, who was a wholesale uh, jeweler. And uh, he sold, he, he, had, he would uh, get these, like, uh, watches wholesale. And I was selling Rolex on the internet for him. He asked me to do that. He's an Israeli guy. His English was terrible. He can't spell if, if his life depended on it. And, um, you know, and I'm a computer whiz. In fact, that's how I met him. I was doing computer consulting. He asked me to put his, uh, his jewelry clients, his database for him, and I was doing that. And then he asked me to put Rolexes, sell Rolexes for him, and I told him I didn't want to do it because I don't know anything about Rolexes. I was like 18 at the time. I had like a $5 watch on my wrist. It would be ridiculous for me to sell Rolexes for him. But we created some sort of a partnership where I was going to take photos, market the watches on eBay, uh, answer all emails, deal with all customer service. He pro just provided me the watches. So he provided it. I sold it. We shared 50-50. I did really well with that. Um, I must have made during college while I'm going to school. I had nine odd jobs before that, and I canceled all of them at once. I told you about that, I think, last time I talked yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. But, but I canceled all of them. I started selling Rolexes, and I must have made like fifty to 75000 a year while I'm in college. So that was a very successful partnership. I was very happy about that. I was able to travel the world and have a decent car while I'm going to school and paying for everything. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that he had a very different skill set. Yeah. His skill set, he, and my, he, he couldn't do what I did, and I I don't have the net resources to like supply watches like he did. But then I got into commercial real estate and it started out actually as a disaster because I started with this partner who before I got into the business with him, I, I'd helped him out on a lot of things and I knew that he bullshitted about a lot with girls, but I never knew that he was such a liar in business, that he was cheating people, deceiving people, and and, and he was front with me about the kind of scams he would pull and he wanted me to give him a high five and I, I had a problem. I had to get out of that. And then he tried to take money from me, and it was, it was just a nightmare. So there's a tendency to, to you know, dishonest people. That's a serious red flag. No, I was young. It was an experience. But, uh, but generally, these partnerships, that partnership was also destructive, and it would have ended anyway, even if you were a liar, because we both had the same skills, and we were both doing the same thing, and we would get tension with each other about whose job it would do because we have the same set of responsibilities. Does that make sense? Right, absolutely, yeah, yeah. In fact, I know exactly, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about because I, I have had that experience too. And I think it is, yeah. it's really difficult because you will end up stepping on each other's toes. Whereas yeah. in, the first, in the first example that you gave, there's a very clear division of labor between what yeah. you were doing and what the, the watch guy was doing. So yeah. I, I think that is a, a great point. Well, I started also, I have a parking company. I'm not involved anymore, but we're really friendly. But I started that with a partner. I don't know jack shit about parking. I still don't to this day. We, we were the fastest growing parking company LA has ever seen. We grew to 26 locations in a little over two years. And it was really fast. And, and basically, he manages, my partner manages everything. I don't know anything about parking. He's been in the business since the 90s. But he's not a good businessman. He doesn't have any money. And he wanted to start his own company company so so i helped fund it and i went out and got all the locations in and he managed them so so i brought in the business he took care of it right. it was a it was a great situation uh i mean I, I can't say that we never had our own tension because i would be upset if like customers started calling i mean they were upset with something he did and if i screwed up something he was upset so there's still plenty of room for tension there but uh, but overall it was a great partnership i'm really glad about it it worked out great so the point is just don't overlap your responsibilities and your skill sets. Yeah. The other thing that, uh, that strikes me about going into the, to, to business with somebody else is that, you know, it's so important to work out what's going to happen if you do decide, like, we're not getting on and this isn't working. Because most people just go into it assuming that everything's going to be great and it's all going to be uh, happy, 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 and the business is going to go well. And if it turns out that you do have completely different views of where the business should go or you, you just hate each other and can't get on, 
what happens yeah. next? You know, if you both own part of the company, then you have to have some way to decide uh, what's going to happen. And that is something that I think a lot of people don't even consider um, up front. I definitely am guilty of that until I did the parking company. And I did get out, actually. And, and basically, yeah, I, we, we had that arranged from the very beginning. So you're right. Most people assume that everything's going to be great. They're going to start this company. It's going to be a great success. Their kids are going to, and grandkids and great-grandkids are going to be fed from this. <laughs> but but um, yeah, it's, it's usually not the case. Usually it ends in explosive, bitter, total all-out war between the two. And uh, yeah, it's, like, it's pretty bad. So what I did was I set up an agreement between us that if we do want out, you know, there, there's, a, there's a way to figure out at that point based on the income that's coming in and, and stuff. Yeah, what yeah the value something, of the company should something be. objective. And, that, and that, that nobody has to pay it right away. It could be paid off over time based off the schedule uh, from the income that comes in. Yes. And we both agree to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's some kind of objective basis so that you're not going to start saying, well, I think I should have this and no, well, I don't think you should have that. But there's some, some objective way to determine it. You know, and the other thing that I've heard that people do um, is the the old principle of uh, like you know when you like when you kids and you share a cake, it's the uh, I'll cut you choose, right? Which is right. basically yeah. if you if you both uh, if you really can't get on, that, then somebody has to leave. And so the question is, okay, well you you decide it like you make an offer, which is one that you would be happy either way. In other words, you keep the company. Um, but you pay off the other person or you accept the payment and they keep the company and that forces the deal to be something that both sides can, can live with basically. That sounds, that sounds brilliant. You know, I, I'm not going to pretend I'm already on dissolution. So I'm, I'm totally open to looking at good ideas and that sounds like a great idea. Mm. So that's, that's working with, um, you know, with other people. I, I agree with you, uh, or rather founding a business with other people. I agree with you that, that, uh, I think it's something really, really to be avoided, if, if possible, because it is such a minefield. And, yeah. Uh, it's such a huge commitment as well. Um, yeah. It, it, I, I, I've seen so many people say that they're going like, to go into business together, and I can see it's a disaster before the disaster actually happens. It, 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 it's too common. And they're so optimistic, I don't want to say anything negative. So I don't, but I can see that, that they're going to... That, that one person is way more skillful mm -hmm. than the other, but they kept themselves having the same exact responsibilities. Yeah. And, and is, that's going to be a, a major nightmare at, at some point. The sad thing is, I think you've probably seen this as well, that I, I, a lot of the time it really is so clear that the decision to go into business together has not been uh, one based on a, a clear division of skills or labor, like, the, like you described with the, right. the, the, the watches guy, but it's more to do with wanting to have moral support you know i think that is really yeah. the ultimate it's reason camaraderie yeah. it's camaraderie but you know what it's interesting it's also kind of like a coach you know yeah. where not a coach as in a coach like a violin coach who makes you a better violinist no it's just kind of like somebody on your ass that makes sure that you're doing things if you're if you're starting a business on your own you get lazy but when somebody uh else is involved they're kind of on your case about it, and it kind of makes you like, okay, get up and start doing some stuff, you know? Mm. So there is that, and that's actually valid, and that's a good thing about partnerships that, that I think is good. Uh, so I support that, but I, I, I really don't think it's going to work out well for you generally unless you have a severe clear division of responsibilities and skill sets yeah and and the fact is that it's also i think if if you if you you're conscious that you need that and that you need coaching um or that you need moral support there's nothing wrong with that but there are a lot easier ways of getting it than yeah. you know committing to a, a business um, partnership with someone yeah finding yourself 50 percent of your company yeah exactly exactly. <laughs> exactly you know and you mentioned before mentors life, a life coach a life coach would be a lot cheaper yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> hell of a lot but cheaper. if you want to if you want to give your life coach 50 percent of your company it's basically the same thing you know it's the okay, same yes. deal <laughs> so just just find a life coach and give him 50 percent of your company if you really want that <laughs> Excellent. That was part one of my interview with Judd Weiss talking about working relationships. I hope you found that useful and I look forward to showing you the rest of the interview in part two. 
Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.